Another perfect landing. I hit the mark. I actually thought about bringing some antennas. I've made some large ones from the basement, and I thought, nah, <laughs> it'd be a lot easier for somebody to uh, look up different uh, antenna geometries. What about resonant harmonics? Nikola Tesla accurately and famously said that uh, secrets of the universe are thinking in terms of frequency and wavelength. I had a lot of people actually say, can you make videos for little rugrats? Well, not rugrats, but, you know, preteens, and I've not a made any videos directed at that. I've tried to keep it simple. You know, such they'd be able to understand fields and geometry and mechanics of Mother Nature. And I rejected that. You actually have to class your YouTube videos differently if they're directed at younger folks, and I don't do that, even though I try to keep the videos really simple. But if I wanted to keep it simple for anybody of any age, I'm trying to explain what the coaxial nature of light is, for example. And people generally, and of course, I grew up soldering stuff together. I got, you know, some soldering irons over there. To keep it simple, because people don't understand what the cross-section of a coax cable is, where you actually have the dielectric medium, medium, the center conductor, and then the shielding around it, which actually acts as a Faraday cage and keeps in um, the signal such that it doesn't become lossy. In other words, the gain of the coax keeps most of, if we think of um, the frequency of the signal um, as uh, least amount of loss, such that it isn't like a sieve, or you're putting a lot of energy into the system, you're trying to get to the antenna. If the actual coax cable is incredibly lossy, you have a problem, thinking in terms of a Faraday cage. What would be the simple explanation of what light would be in explaining the geometry? Or then, of course, you'd have to explain to anybody, including a young person, what a torus is. And you show them, you know, the donut geometry of a torus. And then you have to explain the three-dimensional force vector, which itself is a type of geometry. But it's a three-dimensional geometry. We think in terms of platonic solids, like the talk in terms of uh, harmonic geometry and arch forms here in just a second, because fields themselves have a geometry. You say, well, what would the light be in simplex, to keep it simple? Once you explain what the torus is, and most of you know what a torus is, then you would say, and of course, fields don't propagate, they're actually creating disturbances in the medium. Same thing with sound, and Nikola Tesla famously said, and nobody ever quotes Tesla on this except for me, but light was nothing other than a sound wave in the ether. Well, sound is not an emission. Nothing emits sound. It is a disturbance of oxygen and nitrogen. Nothing emits light. Now, if you say that, that shocks people. Most people, like 99% of people. Of course, light's an emission. It has a speed. It does not have a speed. That's the rate of induction or the hysteresis of the disturbance of the medium. Then you would explain light really simply as a repeating toroid, if you actually have like a string of uh, pearls, if you will. A pearl has a hole through it, of course, when it's strung on a necklace. It's kind of basically a donut shape. So these, uh, I mean, that would be the size of the pearl. You ever seen pearl necklaces really small? The pearls haven't grown for many years inside of the oyster. I'm not talking about cultured pearls. The larger pearls, of course, are more valuable. They've grown longer. I didn't know, but like Saudi Arabia has a rule that you're not allowed to buy or sell or import cultured pearls. Everything there is a real pearl, which is a really good idea. You actually have a string of these toruses you know, on a necklace. So light itself measured in frequency would be equivalent to the size of uh, the pearl itself because you can smaller the little pearls are, the more you can fit per inch on a necklace. Uh, and then explaining light becomes simple. You don't have to say uh, a coaxial circuit, which confuses people. You say, well, they're uh, repeating toruses of the medium. You know, sound, of course, is uh, measured in a frequency that has a wavelength, and of course that corresponds to the pitch, you know, the sound from low to high. And the same is true of light. And nobody ever thinks about or considers, nor were you taught in high school or college, that just think about it for a second. Everything from radio to infrared to visible light uh, to X-ray to gamma radiation up to ultra, ultra high power, which is the fundamental particle, that which we call the proton. 
is one and the same thing. They're only distinguished in frequencies. So explaining light is a repeating disturbance of the medium that appears as a torus. And the thread through which that torus occurs rarefies and compresses, like rarefaction and compression. If we just take that central part out, of course, that is scalar. Of course, we say scalar waves, which is a total misnomer because there's no wave component in scalar. There is a wave component when we're talking about torus, but the wave component is the frequency at which the disturbance itself repeats, and the disturbance is, of course, the medium. But it's not being emitted, and it is not repeating in the sense that, uh, you know, it's manifesting and demanifesting, except in the case of the disturbance of the medium. And this confuses people. All of us, unfortunately, suffer from the human delusion that anything that has a speed is moving from point A to point B. Anyway, I'd like to talk about, I thought about, like I said, bringing up some antennas. You can just look up what a dipole antenna is or like a Yagi antenna. I've actually made at least like 200 antennas. I've soldered them together. They're really simple. And Nikola Tesla was right when he said we need to think of ter everything in terms of frequency and wavelength. And what we're doing is talking about harmonic receptors for things. As I've explained accurately, and people really sent me a lot of emails, left a lot of positive comments in talking about the secret of water, because I've been asked so many hundreds of times, like, well, how do you change the qualitative nature of the water? You say water is an antenna. You know, for the manifestation in consciousness, life is impossible without water. It's like, where within the water molecule is the consciousness? As if it were literally in the oxygen or the hydrogen. And, of course, it's not. There is no, you know, uh, rap music or classical music or anything within any antenna that receives standard AM or FM stations. Of course, it is a harmonic receptor, a resonant harmonic for the manifestation of the signal. Now, you can't take the radio analogy too far because when you take the radio analogy, then you ultimately must talk about the broadcast station. The broadcast station is a matter for another discussion. You can't take it literally to that point, but when you're talking about the radio and the antenna and manifestation of consciousness, you can't take it that far, and it's a nearly perfect analogy, and there's certainly not a, a better one that's ever come up. And I've been asked the question, by the way, here's a simplex diagram. There's three element, four element, nine element Yaggies. You used to see them mounted on people's rooftop. They would point them in the direction of the broadcast station and they'd actually have a lobal gain. Literally what you pointed at, this, you put, point the small end towards the receptor, like if they put radio tags on bears or deer or whatever, they point the Yaggy antenna and it's directional. It has a lobal direction for reception and that specific geometry is called a Yaggy antenna. They can be three element, even two element, up to nine element, even seen 12 and 13 element. This is a dipole. By the way, this looks like the exact same geometry of water. Of course, you could shape this dipole into any, uh, it doesn't have to be a specific angle. The higher you get it, the better. And of course, the ground acts as a reflector. And, and there's no signal in this antenna. I don't know if you know what a dipole antenna Just look up an inverted V dipole antenna. It's basically just. Uh, two leads that are running off of a long uh, stretch of copper wire and you raise it up inside of a tree, for example. It's been done since World War I, World War II. People still do it today. It's not the highest gain antenna and you could listen to shortwave and do transceiving around the world. And you actually cut it to a frequency that you know you're going to be transmitting in or receiving in. And if you cut it to the wrong length, then it has less gain and is less of a harmonic. The harmonic nature of water is that specific geometry, which is the perfect incommensurable. And by the way, that specific geometry of water is the only perfect incommensurable geometry in the entire universe. And that particular, and it's just basically like a, uh, a dipole antenna. Go Google search images of dipole antennas. They look like this. Basically, it's just a roll of copper wire. I've soldered together, oh God, at least 100 dipole antennas. Um, some people actually uh, still do that as a business. They make dipole antennas. It's very easy, just to stretch a copper wire. You solder two leads off of it, which gets uh, soldered onto a piece of coax that plugs on the back of your uh, radio. Of course, not many people do ham radio or transceiving anymore. It's perfect for preppers and people that want to have the ability when cell towers go down, if they ever do, do go down, to transmit and talk and communicate with people around the world. But getting back to the geometry of nature, and of course that is the ultimate geometry of nature in life itself, 
that dipole antenna that makes up uh, the water molecule. But there's nothing in the antenna. Just as there's no classical music or any type of music in any radio antenna, it is a harmonic receptor. Um, people were asking me about the toroidal geometry of uh, water, I mean, excuse me, of, uh, of magnetism. Since uh, the geometry of magnetism is the torus, I say, what, what type of sides does a torus have? Well, let's get on to that. Math, of course, thinks it has two sides, but it's looking at the outside and the inside. But ultimately, the torus is only the three-dimensional expression of the, the uh, three-dimensional S-curve for the extrapolation of loss of energy or inertia of the dielectric, which is counterspatial, increasing inertia and acceleration. And the inverse of that is the force vector. The fundamental force vector, of course, is magnetism. People talk about the five platonic solids. I'm not interested in getting that here. These literal geometries of things that we see in nature, the tetrahedra and the cube, the octahedra and the dodecahedra and the icosahedron. But neither the torus, and this is kind of fascinating, and we'll talk about this and extrapolate on it as quickly as possible, I hope. Some people say I flapped my lips too long. For that, I certainly apologize. But neither the torus nor the hyperboloids have a side. These are the conjugate geometries of force and motion, inertia, and acceleration, or the fundamental geometry of the entire universe. The hyperboloid, of course, is that hourglass shape. It only has one side. The torus only has one side. Can we actually call it a geometry? I mean, does that mean it's one-dimensional? No. And people don't think about that. And when you think of a donut, you think, well, it has two sides. It has an outside geometry, an inside geometry. And if you're a literalist, say, of course, a torus has two geometries. We all know that. And by the way, everybody loves to talk about a vortex. And a vortex is only one side of a torus. You take a donut and you cut it along its uh, lateral point. Um, regarding the toroidal geometry of magnetism, you're just looking at a vortex. And the flip side, of course, is another vortex. It was really windy yesterday, and driving over to the grocery store, there's so many leaves on the ground. There were all these, normally we call them dust devils, but in this case, we would call them leaf devils, I guess you would call them. Is there a specific name for leaf devils? Where the leaves are being spun up by these vortices, you're just looking at a half of a hyperboloid. You're looking at the simplex pressure mediation, the pressure, of course, and the barometric pressure of the air. Everything in nature duplicates itself from macro to micro. So the torus is one-dimensional. Spatial, of course, its whole is not part of the torus. This is where the mathematicians and the people in the geometry will actually talk about the whole of the torus. But the whole, of course, is not part of the torus, nor is the whole of a donut part of the geometry of a donut. Yet people will actually attach it to that and talk about different dimensions or sides to a torus. A physical torus um, obviously has two sides, but not a magnetic torus, which is the three-dimensional force vector of the loss of energy or inertia. Think about it yourself. Think of the universe in absolute uh, simplicity, where you actually have energy correctly uh, denotated as inertia. It has no Cartesian XYZ coordinate. It is a point not in space, and it is even not a point. We just say that for a matter of conceptual parlance. Imagine, however, a loss of energy from that, and why is there any loss of energy at all? And then, of course, you have to get into explaining the Euristos Dia, Sorotolma, Ronanki, as the Greeks correctly understood it, and then, of course, you have to get into monistic metaphysics, which, of course, eliminates out the need for original sin or first cause. Why is there any release of energy at all? Release of energy rather than none at all. The release from that non-Cartesian point, I say point for matter of parlance, what is the geometry of a force vector? The geometry of a force vector is a three-dimensional S-curve. A three-dimensional S-curve, once again, just bend a piece of wire shaped like an S and take each end, bend it inverse to one another. And the totality of extraction of that in three dimensions of a three-dimensional force vector, the three-dimensional S-shaped curves, is a torus. A torus only has one side. A hyperboloid only has one side. Actually, to be more accurate, a hyperboloid is an anti-side. It's the negative image of a torus is a hyperboloid, by the way. This is a hyperboloidal geometry, you know, this little suspended hourglass shape here, which, of course, vanishes where no Cartesian value exists. Here's there's no time. Of course, we can measure time as the sands disappear from here to here. They get added up here and subtracted up here. But right here, 
course, sands are still passing through here, so we can't take that too literally, where there is no time. So, literally a hyperboloid, technically, from the perspective of field geometry, has no sides at all. But for a matter of convention, we could say it's the negative image for the whole geometry, the actual hole inside that torus. But the hole is not part of the torus. In other words, it is the geometry of increasing inertia and acceleration towards anti-Cartesian ultimate reality, towards inertia, towards zero point, towards... I don't know counter space is a nonsense word. Um, so the hyperboloidal is only... hyperboloid, excuse me, I said hyperboloidal geometry of increasing inertia and acceleration is one-dimensional. Is one-dimensional and it is counter-spatial. Technically, it doesn't have sides. Conventionally, when I hold up this, of course, physical hyperboloid, it does have a side. But regarding fields, it is an anti-side. Well, if we take the negative image of a torus, then, of course, we have the hyperbolic geometry of increasing inertia acceleration towards inertia, towards rest, towards the true denotation of the term energy, but it has no sides. It is counterspatial. Its lobes, each one of these, of course, would be a lobe, are only the vortices towards counter space in each half of those of this hyperboloid, of course, being the negative image of the torus, is uh, directed towards counter space or towards rest. You can say directed towards counter space, directed towards rest, directed towards the true original denotation of the term inertia. So a torus is positive time. Yes? A hyperboloid is anti-time. There is, look up this uh, term, by the way, it's called Lamour frequency. It's called geomagnetic precessional torque. This is the reason why there's actually a time variance between the North Pole and the South Pole. Water, by absolute undeniability, every scientist agrees on this, of course, is a polar molecule. Yeah? Water's a polar molecule. Well, when exposed to a polarized field, I be it a North Pole or a South Pole, you get differences in osmotic uptake you were able to actually erase, kind of like erasing a hard drive, people. I tell people, and this is really a good analogy, and, I, and it just came, popped into my head. I've used this hard drive analogy before. People say, where is, where is the consciousness in water? Is it in the oxygen? or the, It's in either one. So you're not making any sense. Like, no, I'm making perfect sense. When you erase a hard drive, for example, by the way, you're not actually erasing the hard drive. You're actually just deleting out what the table of contents says is written onto the hard drive platters. Yeah? But whether that hard drive is new out of the box and it has nothing on it, or it is full of a binary written data from the head of the hard drive, it is denotatively, existentially, empirically, yeah? Quantitatively, 100% identical, whether it's an empty hard drive, say you bought a one terabyte four platter hard drive. Quali quantitatively identical, whether it is full of info or has new out of the box and has nothing on it whatsoever. People say, where's the info? Well, you've changed the qualitative nature of it. And this is the point also, too, that I make. The stuff that you drink at the top, oh, it's quantitatively pure. Mm. <laughs> I hear that all the time about water. It's like, yeah, well, a, a perfectly sealed hard drive is also too pure inside, you know, is hermetically sealed against dust and whatnot. But, you know, it could be full of, like, uh, viruses and, like, triple X stuff. <laughs> it could be full of all sorts of dirty stuff. It's quantitatively a pure hard drive, but qualitatively it's like stuff that could, you know, uh, you know have the government come after you. You know, you'd be like, that hard drive is dirty. It's got... <laughs> It's got top secret info on it, or who knows what sort of filth on it. And this is nearly a perfect analogy when talking about water. If I make a, a dipole or Yagi antenna, I say I know that there's like a military base five miles down the road, and I know they're transmitting on 2.4 gigahertz, for example, and I make a Yagi antenna, here you go, and I point it at the military base, you know. There's nothing in that antenna. Yet it has become a harmonic, if cut to the right shape, yeah? Come a harmonic for receiving information from, say, a military base. I'm just using this as an analogy. Don't take it too literally. So then it becomes a dirty antenna. You know, you're receiving stuff that you're not classified info, for example. <laughs> you have to be able to decode it, too, though, right? 
This is quantitative, qualitative. Talk about the geometry of uh, nature here. So, a torus is positive time, as I said. A hyperboloid is anti-time. A torus is analogous to amperage. A hyperboloid is analogous to voltage. That makes things really simple. The torus is force, as I've explained many, many times. Force, not uh, people confuse when they listen to me. They'll think I'm saying force in motion. No, I'm saying force and motion. The torus is force. The hyperboloid is rest. The hyperboloid is energy. The hyperboloid is inertia. Or the vector towards inertia. True inertia on the hyperboloid would be right here in the middle. The vector towards that inertia is the hyperboloidal geometry that you see before you. Either one of these vectors is a vector towards rest or inertia of the hyperboloid. The torus is illumination, not light. I didn't say light. The torus is illumination. What would that make the hyperboloid? Wouldn't that make the hyperboloid, actually, it's, it's rest point here, light. Wouldn't that make it light? Because right here, there's another formula, and it's my discovery, and it's the secret of the ancient Pythagoreans, and it's a discovery of mine. It's the reason why I tattooed it right here on the inside of my right wrist, 1 over 5 to the power of negative 3. People will say, don't you know that's the number 1 over 5 to the power of negative 3 equals phi cubed, or 4.23. I said, this is an expression. Phi cubed is not an expression. This is the principle against its attribute. That's the reason why I have 1 over 5 to the power of negative 3 tattooed here, and not what that would equal, which would be phi cubed, or 4.236. People don't get that. One's an expression, i.e. the principle against its attribute. Light and illumination, the good and the good. That's a matter for another discussion. The torus is modulation. The torus is frequency and wavelength. The torus is heat. The torus, by the way, is also, too, the anode. The hyperboloid is the cathode. The hyperboloid is light. I didn't say illumination. I said light. But anytime you tell a human being the word light, they think illumination. But there's a distinction. And the devil is in the detail. There's a huge detail in the metaphysics and the field theory and the differentiation between light and illumination. A huge one, yet no branch of science does that. They don't. No branch of science does it. So the hyperboloid is light. The hyperbol excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. The hyperboloid is rarefaction. The hyperboloid is capacitance. It is the cathode. As I said, the hyperboloid, excuse me, the torus is uh, heat. It is the anode. The hyperboloid is uh, chilling. Look up uh, the cold cathode. I don't know if you know what a cold cathode is. Just type in cold cathode. Cold cathode versus heated anode. By the way, no branch of science has ever come close to accurately explaining cathode and anode. They still use ridiculous terms as negative charge. There's charge and there's discharge. There's no such thing as a negative charge. <laughs> the devil is really in the nuance and the details. So, This is the geometry of nature. I hope you understand the antenna principle. Harmonic resonance. This is what Nikola Tesla said, the secrets of the universe are in understanding frequency and wavelength. Harmonics. Every antenna that I've soldered, and I've made a, over 130 antennas, maybe. Over 130 antennas. I've built, soldered together, hooked up to radios for transceiving. They're all just a roll of wire. I started out as a roll of wire. The difference being is how long you cut it and what shape you put it into. Yeah? There's a lot of different disco antennas, Yagi antennas, dipole antennas, on and on and on and on and on. Loop antennas, loop yaggies, they're all the same thing. Copper, uh, copper stuff like uh, 10 gauge, 12 gauge copper wire or braided copper. They're all the same thing. Piece of wire. But you have to know where to cut it and what shape to bend it into. This reminds me of uh, Charles Proteus Steinmetz, who's invited to Ford to fix one of their super huge uh, generators which was a couple stories tall, and he spent days calculating on his chalkboard. And then he made a cut, a mark on the thing, 
And he told a bunch of, because he's a little person, you know, he wasn't, you know, he didn't have the ability to do tools. He made a mark. He told him to cut there and remove two windings. And he sent him like a million dollar bill, which was really, really, really big for back in the 1930s, I think it was, 1930s. And they didn't get it. Well, so they wanted an itemized receipt because it was ridiculous because all he did was calculate in his head and draw a bunch of math for two days. And he put a chalk mark <whistles> on the generator. And they said, we want an itemized receipt. And they said, uh, what was it? Making the mark, $1. Uh, knowing where to make the mark, <laughs> $999,999 or something like that. True story, by the way. I might have had the figure off, but it was basically it was like 99.9% .9 making the chalk mark. <whistles> the rest of it was his brain power to know where to make it. <laughs> Antennas are the same way. You could have copper wire. It's like if a fool doesn't know how long to cut it. And this all gets down to field geometry. And this all gets down to harmonic resonance. There is nothing in oxygen and hydrogen molecule, this thing we call the water molecule. I keep saying over and over again that consciousness requires water. And people will ignorantly ask, where in the water is the consciousness? It's not in the water. Just there's a, when you hang up a Yagi, uh, or just make it simple, a dipole. When you hang up a dipole antenna, you know, there is not like uh, Radio Moskva or uh, you pick up Radio Japan. You know, there's nothing. There's nothing in that copper wire. It become a harmonic resonance for the reception of the signal. And all these signals are nothing other than one and the same thing. Ether perturbation modalities, which is all a field is anyway. What's a field? No branch of science has told you what a field is. It's not my opinion. It's a fact. I told you simply what a field is. Because if you can't explain it to a child, you don't really understand it. What's a field? <coughs> Fields and ether perturbation modality. So anyway, this is the geometry of fields. I've uh, more clearly given a better analogy for explaining water and the manifestation for consciousness. I hope you liked this video. If you did, send me an email. My contact info is in the description below. Any donations always warmly welcome. Yeah. Or you can tell me how much you hated the video. Yeah. Whatever makes you happy. Yeah. Have a lovely weekend. Borsheva mi spasiba. That's for the Russian folks out there watching. The other folks, Slava Ukraina. <laughs> Aloha, hasta luego, dos vidanya, uvidimsa. Thank you so much and have a lovely week. <laughs>